Let's have everyone up here introduce ourselves and we'll just start chatting away. I'll be somewhat prodding our discussion along because I have so much energy and do that all the time. Um, so yeah, uh, let's go. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, my name's Loretta Prevo. I work as a cinematographer. I've been in New York about 12 years. I've been working as a cinematographer for about 11 of those years. Um, um, I do a lot of narrative, and in the last couple of years, I'm focusing more on social justice-oriented documentary work. That's my nutshell, I guess. Sweet. Um, I'm going to do this now. Uh, I'm Jamal. I'm a former PA and current producer at NBC News. Uh, I make documentaries and things like that. Uh, my name is Phil Prince. I'm a location manager and also producer. Um, freelance, features, uh, reality, whatever it is, I hop onto it. Uh, I've been doing it for about six years now and uh, been in New York for seven. So, sweet. Um, so, I, I want to remind all of you this isn't so much a panel despite the setup, but like a discussion. So, feel free to say things. I may have a microphone, but I can hand it to you if you have something to say. Um, I want to start off by just asking. Oh, there's a free hand mic as well. <laughs> um, I want to start off by just asking the two of you guys, um, like, what is your experience being a minority in on your film sets, offices, your production offices, and things like that? Has anything stuck out for you? Uh, one thing that has definitely stuck out for me, um, and I and I know Jamal, you. I'm guaranteed that you've heard this from either your mother, father, whatever, and your family. Um, you have to work twice as hard to get just the same amount. Uh, so I started six years ago um, in locations. I actually um, went and became a location manager on my first ever gig. I was a PA for about a week. Um, and yeah, no, ridiculous. Um, I graduated the degree in criminal justice. Um, didn't want to go to law school, so family wasn't happy with that. Didn't want to be... Uh, state trooper, definitely we're not happy with that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, after spending about $80,000 in education, I said I want to work in film. Um, and after the heart attacks, they were like, okay, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. And so I was working uh, unpaid for about a week. And all, all the other interns were kind of like chilling, hanging out, you know, like, oh, this is my first little film gig. Let me see how it is. And of course, I came with the mindset of like, if I fail at this week, I don't get it next week. And if I fail that next week, I'm not going to get the next one. Um, and I was lucky enough that uh, the producers and um, line was pretty, it was pretty diverse. I had female producer, um, uh, black male, uh, UPM, Ty, Ty Walker. If you guys ever meet him, he's great. He's in Atlanta and all over. Um, you know Ty? Oh. Um, <laughs> well, they looked at me and they didn't like the location manager and they had seen me kind of shadow him for a while and they were like, do you want to go over and take over that position? Which, if you think, is kind of a crazy ask at the time. Um, I, that was my first ever time on a film set. That was my first ever time, <laughs> like, even seeing what a location manager does. Um, but they saw that I had enough tenacity and, like, uh, wherewithal to be able to do the job. And they said, you know what, go ahead and do that. And then from that gig, the designer took me on a James Franco movie. And then from that one, I went on Louie and then just kept going and going and going and going. So that kind of push while well, um, oftentimes if we're not, you know, cis white male, we don't get those same opportunities that if it comes around and we have to push ourselves to that next level in order to get it, we're able to get it. But it is difficult. It is difficult. Um, I guess I can only know my own anecdotal experience. So I don't necessarily think of it as I have had less opportunities because I'm a woman, just because I don't know how it would have been different if I you know, was a man. So I, hmm, so I don't think of it that way. I guess when I first started out, I seed a little, and I joined the union. And some of those experiences were probably a little bit, you know, hmm. I guess I didn't really think out what I wanted to say when I started that, that <laughs> statement. Um, but I certainly, as an AC, had some experiences where this actually wasn't a union thing, but where a DP was like very sexually harassing, um, which is not exactly what we're talking about either. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I guess as a D, as a DP, you're less likely to be in that position where you know you have less bosses that could maybe take advantage of you. Um, so yeah, I find it a hard question. I don't think of it like, oh, I'd be more advanced if I was if I was a different person. Um, but what I do see is a lot of my 
white male peers defaulting to you know recommending and hiring other white males. So that's I mean I feel like I can see that objectively, but I don't know how it may or may not have influenced me. Does that ring true for any of you guys? Oh. Sweet. Um, how do you deal with instances of any discrimination or just feeling uncomfortable on a film set? What's your name? My name is Andy. Andy. I say, hey, I'm not craft service. I'm just Hispanic. A lot. I usually either get a pretty big laugh. I either get a really big laugh, or I get um, like, oh wow, and I'm like, I could, I could make that joke. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> what about you guys? Oh uh, wow. I, I mean, I kind of do the same response you do. I kind of joke it off. Um, oftentimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I could get hurt about it every single time, and I try to, like, um, I try to marshal my emotional energy of how I react, depending on how serious the offense is. Um, most of the time, since I'm doing locations, I make sure the trucks are landing, blah, blah, blah. Um, somebody will come up to me, hey, uh, parking PA, can you move that cone for me? I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's how we did. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? And I point to the sign. That right there, my name, who's holding all this, that's me. I'm, I'm the manager. Hi, nice to meet you. And just leave it at that, you know, like... Make, make a joke out of it. At least I try to, most of the time. Yeah, I guess I make a joke out of it, too. I mean, I guess, so maybe when we first get to a set, people don't presume I'm the DP, but, like, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, I guess if there is discrimination, I like kind of the head-on, you know, slightly funny confrontation. <laughs> I'm glad that we're all, like, somewhat witty. Uh, what's up, buddy? So, my question, this is kind of like a two-and-a-half-parter. So, Loretta, you... Do you find it? Do you find it as like microaggressions because you're a cinematographer who happens to be female? And do you ever hear through osmosis or through the grapevine, it's like, oh, she's she's really difficult, and you're like, but if I were a man, I wouldn't be considered difficult. I'll just become really focused. So the one thing that occurs to me is the one time that I had a key grip quit on me uh, on a job. He told me that I couldn't tell him what to do. I have no idea if that was gender related, but I just don't imagine him saying that to his male DP. Um, I don't know if that's kind of an answer. Okay. I, don't, I don't think, hmm. I don't feel like I face too many microaggressions, but I'm, I work on a very kind of low budget indie scale where it, you know, it kind of feels friendly often. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. What, what was your question about microaggressions? I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, that was yeah. pretty much the question. Like, you, be, you being a cinematographer that happens to be a woman. Right. Like, you, you, I, I, like I, sh I shoot, and I, and I used to AC, and when I, when I AC'd, a lot, of, a, lot of my a lot of my cinematographers were women. Yeah. Not, not by choice, just because, like, oh, okay, whatever, like, the, <clears throat> whatever. And like I remember, like my seconds, they would bit, they would excuse my language, they would complain a lot, and yeah. like, oh man, like why she, like, why blah blah, like she's so difficult. I'm like, I, I, I didn't know how my my the synapses in my brain was so confused by that. I was like, but we worked for a, a cinematographer last week that didn't know what they were doing, like mm -hmm. they're, yeah. they're they were totally incompetent, like so objectively. Ma maybe like female in general, not necessarily even in this role. If like a guy is confident, but a woman doing the same thing might be bitchy. Yeah, yeah, ex that's yeah, that's what I'm like. And I, I was wondering, I guess, I guess now that I'm articulating this, like how you said you only experienced that in one instance, but if you were to, experience I think it, I definitely like. First of all, I think I used to be bitchier, and I'm just nicer in general now, and I don't think that's related to my gender. I think <laughs> just growing up as a person, yeah. you know? Like, it's more yeah. about us I all... A certain that. amount of maturity, we're just like, eh, fuck it. Yeah. It's all about us being, like, happy together as we make this thing. It's not the end of the world that we make it right now. No, exactly. Um, oh, I did have something I wanted to say, and then my mind kind of blinked. Um, I think that... I probably approach, oh yes, this is what I was gonna say, that often, and I think this was related to that time of that person you know, quitting too, that a lot of genie is often who, who has like the bigger dick, and I think I can very consciously just not play the game, you know, cause like you win, <laughs> you know? So it's easy, so I feel like, I don't know, maybe I kind of mm, act in a certain way to like, be a positive force, whereas maybe I'd be a little bit more direct if I was a dude, but I don't know. Oh, I have one specific question regarding that, because as a DP, um, I've, I've always felt that like the DP, in terms of creative decisions, 
you're not going to get as many questions as, for example, um, I've worked with a lot of female UPMs, female producers, um, which they, I've seen them get a little bit kind of that thing. So do you feel that it's because you're technical and creative, specifically for your department, and that kind of a production and uh, everyone's you know, kind of moving the army together, do you feel that it, they have to kind of listen to you more like the word of God or goddess? I think so much in film is subjective. And so just like if you're the DP, maybe compared to your lighting people, like we're just going with my, sub, my mm -hmm. subjectivity. <laughs> you know, like we're gonna talk about it and then like we're just, you know, both of these are valid and, and mine wins because one has to win. Whereas maybe something like a producer or UPM, it's more like, well, no, there has to be one right way or something. Exactly, like following that, to, okay. Um, one thing I've been fascinated by a lot <clears throat> in the past couple of years is the idea of like the diversity problem. Um, it's been a big coverage point for like Variety and Hollywood Reporter. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of numbers around it. Um, but on a more personal level, like when you're on like sets and in your offices, does it feel like there's a problem around you happening? Like I was, no, 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 wait, does it feel like a problem? Yeah, does it feel like there's a diversity problem? Do you feel that in your everyday goings on in your pursuit of your jobs, wherever you are? I, I think it's unfortunate that because it has become normal, I don't feel as much as a problem unless, again, something will arise to the point where I have to directly address it. But I can say in the reverse of that, uh, I just came off of uh, a set, which is by far the most diverse I've ever worked on. Um, it was a trans film, so every day we had people of different genders, um, different sexualities, different races. I mean, we even had three redheads on set. It was crazy, super diverse. <laughs> Um, but it was like it was like fun time every single day. It was like crack. I mean, it, everyone was just joking, and um, I don't know how fun time crack is, but um, everyone was just joking, hanging out, sharing each other's ideas and identities and conversations and cultures. And it was, it was like a, honestly, it was by far the most fun I've had on a film set in a very long time. Um, I don't know if it was just because of everyone is cool and fun, or is also the diverse aspect, but I definitely know that there was a part of it that had to deal with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I couldn't, I, I can't know the full on percentage, but I definitely felt like a lot of this good times I'm having is because everyone's so open to everybody else and, upset, and uh, accepting um, and kind of understanding in a way. I don't, I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to word it, but um, there, there is definitely some positive aspect that came from having such a diverse set. Um, yeah, uh, maybe it's a good time to bring up what we were talking about earlier or a little. So I feel like in my position, I'm often able to bring on a lot of the crew. Like you, you get to influence the lighting and, and camera and often you're recommending sound and whatever. Um, so to go into this for a second, I, to me, it's very important to make a conscious effort to recommend, in addition to white men, uh, you know, non-straight, non-white, non-male uh, people. And to, to me, what makes this whole, the whole diversity issue so positive is that it, in my head, it is so easy to fix. Like, uh, you know, there's other things I care about in life, like the planet is burning, and I don't know how to fix that, but like all I have to do to diversify my film set is to recommend a diverse group of people and to hire a diverse, diverse group of people. So part of my, um, you know, sets, like I think so often we kind of like just flip to like, oh, who's the last person I worked with that I like? And it, it takes more effort to kind of pause and be like, okay, and if I'm recommending that person, who is someone else that like is not just a white man that I can also consider and recommend? And the, I don't know, the, the topic I'm most interested in talking about tonight is how we can get everyone, including white men, to thinking that way and to like making a conscious effort, you know, because I think, I think a very problematic thing is just hiring the best person for the job because most people just know mostly white men because that's most of who works in this industry. So I think figuring out a way to position this in a way that doesn't alienate white men because that's who we actually really need to think about this this way. You know, like if, if every white guy that, that could recommend someone also stopped and thought about recommending a non-straight, non-white, non-male person, that would be great. <laughs> How do we do that? <laughs> so I don't have an answer for you. Um, what is your name? Uh, my name is Quincy Ledbetter, um, filmmaker. Um, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I I believe it does have to be deliberate um, because 
like you said, one thing I noticed, and I'm, I'm not a white male, as you can see. Um, Word. But I have, yeah, <laughs> go figure. Uh, I have noticed that it, it, it's not a deliberate thing. It's not like a white male says, oh, I need somebody for this job. Let me find the nearest white male to, to fill it. But there needs to be a change. There needs to be a shift in their mind to, to address the, the lack of diversity because nothing is more sobering than, and I've, I've had this all the time where I walk in the room and I'm the only one. Um, and it happens almost every time. Uh, my, my first full-time digital media job was at Company A, and I, was, I went in for my interview and I was sitting in the lobby and I was looking around and, you know, it, you notice it. Like, everyone is white. I'm the only one here. And I immediately thought, I don't stand a chance here. You know, that's the feeling I had going in. Um, and I had to like, I had to turn it on. I had to like, all right, I have to just like, I don't know, it's, it's a weird feeling when you're, you walk in and it feels like it's on purpose. And you're like, there's no way it, it can't be, but if it's not on purpose, how did it get this way? How is everyone here the same person? Um, it's also sobering when you walk in the room and you're not the only one, but the only other people that look like you are the ones sweeping the floor, hanging up the lights. Uh, and it, it, excuse my language, it's with you because it's like, am I supposed to be doing, am I allowed to do this? You know, you have to like go through that. Am I supposed to be here? Um, am I allowed to do this? And that's something that is another conversation that happens in the black community. It's like, there's certain things that we're told that we're not allowed to do indirectly. Um, and the lack of diversity just perpetuates that. Uh, and that's something that I, I deal with with like the so can we can we stay with that because yeah. I, I have so many white guy friends that I think are good people that just hire the best person for the job and don't think about it in this different way so so what do we do hey I'm Robert Michael and uh, hey, Robert. as the white guy in the room uh, <laughs> thank you for being here I, no I, I want to um, I want to share I want to add to something that, that you have you have an inherent advantage in this situation right you, you have 10 men in a room, right? And you're the only non-white male in the room, right? You stand out instantly. So you have a tremendous opportunity when people are interviewing, when people are talking to you. I, I, I notice people, you, you, you have to, if you're excellent, it doesn't really matter, but you already stand out, right? You go through an interview, it's like, oh, well, you got the guy in the pink shirt or the guy in the dark pink shirt or you know, the guy with the blue tie or the red tie. You stand out, you have an opportunity there, right? And so as long as you, you, you're, excellent at what you do and you're a professional, I think that, that stands out more, especially on a film set. It, my experiences, I mean, I work mostly in the Jersey market, so we're a little more homogenous over there. I imagine hey, Jersey. We're, we're, hey, we're a little less diversified, and I was in Columbus uh, this week, and they're even less diversified. It's more homogenous as you go towards the Middle East, the bigger cities, you're gonna have more diversity, of course, but to me, that's an opportunity. If you're already it's, in the room, it's, it's, if, you're if, you're, already if you're already in the room, if you're if you're interviewing at a job and, and just you know, like I said, there's nine nine white guys, they all have you know the same kind of background, but you come in and you have a completely different take, a completely different attitude in the creative industry. I think that's a huge opportunity. Yeah, and to your point, uh, pass the mic. This is a cipher. Um, to your point, um, you're right. You're right. I, I, you know, coming in the room and being the other. A lot, sometimes can be a benefit, but sometimes people look at you like, what are you doing here? You know, and it's, it's I'd say it's 50, I get 50-50. I get that for age. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, I'm, dude, when I tell people I'm 37 years old, they look at me like I told them I You're have 24 hours. You're 37. Black 37. don't crack. <laughs> see, see, see? People look at me like I've told them I have 24 hours to live, but that's a whole other thing. Um, when I met Marvin, we met at, oh, that's or, we, had, we met at organization event A, hey, we uh, X. We can't say what it is, but Mar we, it was another situation where me and Marvin were the only ones. And Marvin saw me across the room. He was like, "How the what did he have to do to get here?" You know. And at that point, sure, we have a, an advantage as far as like, oh, these these guys stand out. They have something else to offer but we have to cut throats to get 
there in the first place. So it's like, it's like a 50-50 thing. You're right, though. You're right. It's like a 50-50 thing. And I wish that we didn't have to, like, cut so many heads, you know? <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, that's, that's all I got. Did someone in the, did you have something you wanted to say at some point? Maybe? I'm, I'm curious to talk about that, that mindset of uh, the moment before, whether you're, you, whether you're qualified or not, just that, that moment when you walk in the room. I don't know. I was curious to hear more about that. And in, in what way? Um, what we can like, do what to change that? Just, just what, that. What, what, what can we... I mean, it has to be like a why does it happen? What, what can we do to, to fix it? Yeah, yeah, let's brainstorm what we can do to fix it. So, I mean, cause one thing we were talking about before, too, is so often these panels are like, this is an issue. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are some solutions? <laughs> so, like, what, I don't know. I, I think it would be great if we, like, really use this as a brainstorming session and, like, kind of spitballed and, like, presumed that 80% of the ideas will be stupid, but, like, let's just say them. But, like, how do we actively do that? So, like, I can actively pause before I recommend or hire someone and think about it. But, like, if, the, if what needs to happen is to get more white guys on that same thinking process, like, what do we do? Like, do I direct, do I call five of my friends and be like, hey, I want to take my time and emotional energy to have this conversation with you and to see if you'll start thinking this way before you hire something? Like, that, that is my one idea. Now somebody else. Thank you. Um, my What's your name, name, buddy? My name's Alberto. Um, I think that the first idea that came to my head is that everybody in this room that has power and influence uh, in choice and in creation of product, uh, I think it's kind of, if, if you feel like this is a thing that matters to you, which I hope so, because you're in this room, um, that it's kind of, I'm not trying to be like mean about it, but it's kind of your job to like talk to everybody in this room, because like we came here for that reason. Like it's like, you know, I hope that it's not just a panel where it's like, oh my God, this issue's like really hard. And, and instead it's like, I made this panel or I'm contributing to this panel. People that feel this issue, like that have been struggling, like they're going to come, even if it's three of them. And it's like my job as a person in power, whatever race, gender, or class they have, if you have ability to move people through this system that, that will give us less trauma, as you can tell from the quivering voice, like, that's, that's kind of the job. I know that's what I'd do if I was there. I'd be like, when is this over so I can go talk to y'all and y'all can tell me, like, why, like, in what part of my next project you can be a part of, you know? Yeah. I also want to know your answer to your own question, because I think you're going to talk about solutions anyway. I am? I think so. <laughs> I think, I just like thinking about it, ideating. Um, okay, um, let's start with story time. So, I didn't think of an answer to this question. <laughs> All right, so I want to think of my first and last like jobs as a PA. I think that like racial dynamics on film sets are highlighted when you're a PA. Um, my very first job um, was on a popular home improvement television show. Um, and one of the days we were working on set it was the day Maya Angelou died. Um, so I was sad because I'm like artsy and black. Um, and there was a D the DP just started making fun of me for it, um, like over walkie. Uh, so I couldn't ignore it because it was in my ear. I um, mean, he spent the whole day doing that. And then like at some point in the afternoon, he called me a f um, on walkie. Um, so everyone heard it. Um, I forget. Um, <laughs> But, but let's go back to pointing people out. Yeah, I'm just wondering why the DP but, had a walkie. Yeah, so um, this, this whole thing happened, and eventually like, the result of that was me being fired from the job. Um, like, two years, right? Um, 18 months later, I was, like, a PA, my last PA job on popular television comedy show. Um, and camera department, PA, all the, the DP was a female for the first two weeks. She brought me in as part of her. I want to find people who aren't white dudes. Um, the rest of the department was all white guys. They were just, they bullied me most of the time. One day, like an overnight shoot, like three in the morning, I went on the, film, the camera truck and just started crying. The producer of the show came out and saw me. He was like, oh, this sucks, hope you feel better. After the show, he apologized and was like, hey, I wish there was something I could have done, um, which made me ask myself, how is the, the show that you produce feel powerless in the situation? I always wonder, like, 
I've spoken to a lot of guys, mostly white men in power, and who say, I see things happen that, I, that you could probably stop, who feel powerless to do, to do that. Um, I guess I would ask that people stop being such wimps and actually, um, it's okay to make people feel uncomfortable if you see someone getting bullied. I think people are more comfortable just keeping the status quo of stratification than making their white male friend DP feel uncomfortable for a few minutes because he calls someone. Um, my, that's, that's my solution. Stop being scared of awkward interactions. Um, I, I, I want to hop into that because I, I, I completely agree with, with what you're saying and the fact that I, I oftentimes see, whether it's department heads or above the line people, let things slide for that very reason, as, as, as if they don't have power that they've gotten to attain over years of, uh, of experience and knowledge. And I, I also don't quite find that um, acceptable, to, to, be, to be very frank. Um, Especially because, uh, you know, I take it upon myself as locations to kind of, um, whether people don't see it or not, kind of like protect everyone, every single department. And I've always felt that they should as well. Um, so when it comes to situations like that, I, I honestly do want to see more filmmakers in whatever position feel more empowered to be like, this person uh, is feeling unsafe or um, is being made to feel negatively some for some reason about... Um, how they react to things are just overall the course of the day and how they're being treated. Uh, and I think that is more of a, a power amongst the people base drive that's going to have to happen. Um, uh, it kind of started a little bit when it comes from Slates for Sarah in terms of just safety on set, but I, I think there's more than just physical safety that we have to take an account as filmmakers amongst ourselves. Um, emotional safety, uh, you know, psychological safety. I mean, think about this. We're all out here for 14 hours every single day. People might let something slip that's going to be hurtful, or people will say it intentionally. Either way, it does not matter. We have to look out for each other. Otherwise, we're just we're we're just fish to the slaughter. Like it doesn't make sense to me. What do you want to say, sir? So, so, I mean, what I'm hearing, um, you know, just from my my viewpoint is, I hear a lot of filmmaking talk. Right, but I don't hear much about um, leadership development. I don't hear much about leadership education. I don't hear much about personal branding. Right. So, for example, you, uh, you made a comment um, about you know uh, Maya Angelou dying, and you said because I'm a black whatever, and that's a brand that you put off. And so, if you're if you're not presenting yourself as a professional, and if you're not not um, trained in developing people below you and organ running an organization in a professional manner. That, that will help um, get rid of a lot of that bias like you have in corporate America. You, know, you, you get rid of a lot. I, I came up through the Marine Corps and right off the bat in the Marine Corps, it, it doesn't matter, you, green, purple, red, you know, four legs, it doesn't matter um, who you are. You do the job, you get the job done, you have to work with what's in front of you. Um, so I'm just wondering to you guys, what kind of experience or training or um, resources have you put towards that and, and you know, how do you see that impacting the way, you know, either your, your knowledge or your lack of knowledge impacting the, the way you're presenting yourself to the industry? Well, um, let, let me respond to, to one thing you're saying um, in regards of leadership growth. Uh, my personal statement that I, I tell everybody who works underneath me in the locations department or whether I'm producing, uh, whatever, is um, two things. Uh, at the end of this job, we're gonna discuss three things that we could have done better, um, and three things we're proud of. And number two, if you're still working for me in a year in the same position, I failed you. No one who works underneath me should be working with me next year in that same position. You, if you're the UNIPA, you're gonna be the assistant. If you're the assistant, you're gonna be the ALM. If you're the ALM, I expect to be going for jobs against you, period. Um, and that's just because I fully feel, again, from that first job where they looked at me as, oh, you've been on here a week, but we think that you can do it, and build you up, and sat there and made sure that after the end of the job they could push me away to do my thing. That is the same way that I go about uh, working with other people. I mean, that's not everyone's particular mindset in, in the filmmaking industry. Um, I wish it was more so the case, so that we could be building up these leaders to be able to hire more people. Um, and I guess on my end, just what I try to do um, is that I try to uh, show my department 
as a place where people can grow and then be sent off someplace else. So you're not gonna have the same um, AC hiring the second AC or the camp PA in that same squad. But yes, it's great to work with the same people all the time and it's familiar and it's easy. You can hop right into a job and keep going. Um, but if you're not growing the people around you, what are you really doing? Uh, so Jamal, Qu Jamal and Quincy knows, <clears throat> we already know each other. Um, I have start my, like I have a fun one. I have a funny I have a funny name. My name is Marvin Van Buren. So on paper you're joking. Yeah. So on paper so on paper people think I'm white and ten years older. So like, <laughs> no no no. So like that's that's the truth. That's the truth. So I I had a I had a more I come from a, 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 a somewhat pa place of privilege. I. My parents, I was raised in the fairly upper middle class area, the good schools, whatever, whatever. I'm, I've, I kind of, the, the thing that Quincy mentioned before and what Alberto mentioned about being in a lobby, it's like whatever, whatever. People don't even know that they're interviewing me until like five minutes in. This, this happens before. When Quincy and I first met, the, the said event, the said event, it's the top, the top, film and video people in New York. So, and, and Quincy's a better human being than I am, but he wasn't lying when I was like, it's, it's another, per, not another person, called, but another black person. This guy must be really good. This guy must be really, really good. So I, would, I walked over to really drunk and I was like, how'd you get in this group, man? <laughs> like, dude, you don't have the funny last name. You have a funny last name, but you're like, you're, you're like, whatever, whatever. So, I moved up the ranks fairly quickly. I was a video producer, last out video producer Esquire, one of video leads uh, at this fashion production company, was a DP. I started DPing out the gate because I went, to, I went to a private school that a lot of people didn't like loading film, so I started shooting things quickly. So I moved up faster than like, say, even, even I, I moved up white guy fast. I moved up <laughs> white, white guy fast. White guy so, fast. Like, <coughs> I, I'm in a position where I actually do, hi, I, I'm in a position, Jamal and Quincy can attest to this, you guys know that I'm in a position where I can actually do hire people. I hire, I, I always recommend people, women, uh, women of color, because they're the most underrepresented uh, group in, in the United States, women of color, women, um, different sexual orientations. Um, I post jobs all the time with direct emails. Um, my, anyone, know, every, anyone who knows me knows how, but I'm, I'm the dude with and slick mouth and like have a strong personality. So my brand has always been like, Marvin talks a lot, of shit, but he's really good at what he does, and he's he's good at taking care of his people. Um, to, to, in that regard, in terms of leadership, uh, leadership and branding, but it is difficult because filmmaking is the most expensive. It's the most. It doesn't. It leaves. It leaves a large carbon footprint, so to speak, in terms of economics and resources and people and time. A, a person, uh, a said, per, you know, it's not a, it's not a white or black thing. A, a person, even who who is white, from a, a, a not as affluent background, it's hard to move up when you come out of college with fifty thousand dollars in debt. To take, it's a privilege to take a week, an, an unpaid job for a week. It's, it's, it's not even, it's, it's not a thing. So, the solution for that is like, again, like. I'm, I, I'm acting on that as like, I'm in a, and I'm in a place where I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best to put, pe just to put people in the room, even not only black, not only Asian, not only Hispanic, not only, uh, you know, in, like native, natives, but even white people, my, white people, like my, my last, I replaced myself in my last job with a, with a guy from South Carolina who's white. So it's, you know, it's just, yeah. Um, kind of piggybacking on what you're saying and also what you said earlier, I think that, and also what, what you said about like solutions. Like, I think that two things have to happen in tandem and one of them is like leadership training and changing, kind of like what I said before, changing the mindset of um, white men that only hire white men, but also changing the mindset of uh, minorities and women and minority women to let them know that they're allowed to do this. Thank you. Because you can't have leaders when they don't know that they can be a leader. And like the one thing that happens to 
uh, specifically black men, is like when we grow up, we're told over and over and over from every, everywhere that we're going to be dead or in jail by the time we're 28. Like, that's a real thing that I was told by everyone, teachers, television, documentaries, the news. You're going to be dead or in jail by the time you're 28. So when I turn 25, I'm like, I, you know, I'm almost out of here. And then when I turned 28, I, I had this really sobering moment where I looked around and I noticed that it happened to a lot of the people around me. And then I had like survivor's guilt, like I'm still here. Now what am I gonna do? And I was like, okay, I have my whole life ahead of me. I can do anything. But you've only been told that you're gonna be dead or in jail. So it's like, oh, I'm not even supposed to be here right now. So like it's hard to get into a leadership mindset when you're constantly told that you'll never be anything except dead or in jail. Now, on the, on the flip, I'm fortunate that I had, you know, crack the, crack the whip educators as parents, and they were the only ones in my life telling me that, nah, that's not, you're, you don't have to be dead or in jail. So, like, I had the mindset to where, you know, to, to bring it back to filmmaking, I'm, I'm self-taught. And my dad told me, like, if you do something, kind of like, uh, I forgot, your name, but the brother here, like Phil. Yeah, Phil. Like, if you do something, you have you have to do all of it. So, out of naivete, I thought, like, I thought Steven Spielberg was holding the camera and then going sitting at Ed Bay editing his movie. I I thought that's how it was done. So that's how I taught myself. So when I went into my first interview at Company A, I was, I thought I I didn't stand a chance, but they were like, what the, you know, you're just the Bionic Man, like, you know. <laughs> How do you know how to do all this stuff? So, like, I think that to get minorities and women and minority women to be in leadership positions, we have to change that mindset that we're not allowed to be leaders and that we're never going to because statistically, there are less of us that are. And the statistics are oftentimes tell us that we never will be. The, also, in tandem, there needs to be leadership training of people who are in leadership positions and who are statistically more likely to become leaders to tell them that diversity is not a quota, it's, it's, it's um, a benefit. Because like you said earlier, like the benefit of having diverse people on your team is that they have a different approach. Like my approach, simply because of what I just said, like me growing up thinking I'm gonna be dead by the time I'm 28 and then surviving, that my, my outlook on life is, completely different from the white kids that grew up on the, up the street from me. So like, I'm telling different stories. And they're telling different stories too. So like, that's the benefit of diversity. And I think that's what we need to start teaching people as opposed to like, I gotta have a, I gotta have a gay person on my team because diversity, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> gotta have a black dude on my team because like, I don't wanna look like I'm not diverse. I think that those two things have to happen in tandem. And it is a leadership training kind of thing, so you're right, and I don't know. Uh, Does that I, make I just sense? Wanna, I want to hop in there real quick, because... Yeah. Um, hop in there. Uh, I've kind of coined, I don't know if it's actually a phrase, but I, I've just called it like passive assumptiveness. Um, that idea, again, that you can't be in this certain things. Um, I remember I was, I was working on a film in Jersey, and um, I think it was the key PA. Uh, she was, you know, trying to pack everything up to go, and I said, "All right, cool. Like you're gonna be the last truck out. Whatever. I'm gonna get everybody else going. Um, I think everyone else is going out there. They're wrapping up set." And I came back about 30 minutes later, and she hadn't really packed anything. Um, and she said, "Like you know, that's what you get for leaving a girl in here to pack the truck by herself." And I said to her, "I." can never, ever, ever doubt what your capabilities are. If you're doing that for yourself, that's one thing. But I trust you fully to do this job. We've, all hi we've hired you on this job because we have full faith in you. Please, I don't want to hear you doubt yourself again. Um, that rest of the week, she didn't complain. Um, she pushed through. Uh, and at the end of it, like she kind of saw something in herself. Now she's a location assistant. On a, some, I think it's Orange or something like. She's on a Netflix show right now, um, but that first time she had that mindset that like, I can't do this. It's, it, like, why would you expect me to do this? I'm I'm never gonna expect you to to do anything other than the capability of the job that you're hired for because I feel you can uh, do that. Yeah. So what's your name, buddy? My name is Tashim Tolliver. I'm not in the film industry. I'm an electrician, but I'm. 
looking to get into the film industry. But anyway, to go on, what you were saying, it's all about building confidence in people. I don't think you should look for a way to make people, I mean, you, you ask them how would other white men give people chances. You don't wanna have a person come in and feel like you're handing him a handout. You want him to work for it. So it's all about the other person on the other side coming in with confidence. You have to have confidence in yourself. So I think that that will help a lot if the person that's coming in for the job has a little confidence in herself. So. Yeah, I think it's just making a conscious effort to consider someone in a different bracket that feels weird to say, not like to give them the job because of a certain reason, but to just make a conscious effort that I'm not only looking at this one group, that I'm putting other names on the table. Has anyone seen someone make like a conscious effort to diversify their set or office and like saw it just work? How did it work? What's up, man in the back? Yeah. You have to talk in the mic. What's your name, by the way? Uh, my name is Jesus Santana. I am currently an social producer at Complex. I'm sorry. And yeah? I was throwing shade. Oh, okay, okay. Sheesh. Um, it's an everyday struggle. And I mean, hmm. Complex is known for like hip hop culture, and I know people in HR try their best. I mean, all eight of the higher ups are white, surprisingly to me. It was fairly surprising, um, and they just hired people in HR to diversify it purposely because who better to produce hip hop culture? than people of color, you know? So that's a pretty good move, I feel, obviously. Oh. Yeah? Is that like answering your question? Yeah, it is. To, uh, what else? What other things have we seen work in the past? Anything? I have a really weird story of it not working. Tell me. Um, so I got brought on to a shoot. We were doing a, um, a, a like a live event. Uh, let's, let's consider like a, a news kind of thing. I sent in a list of crew for, because uh, I was the, the New York guy, they were, they were flying in from a distance. I sent in um, uh, camera and I sent in sound, I sent in lighting um, crew, and I realized that when we got to set that they had only hired the men out of the list. And it was a really sobering moment standing there looking at the other guys <coughs> in the list, or looking at the other guys, because we were all friends, and it was like, yeah, they did. So uh, that, that actually frustrated me as standing there with a group of white guys, Thanks. which is actually one of the things that kind of led to this discussion happening. So, yeah. For the moment, I want to go back to, I forget whose question about have we seen this working, um, having a, a set that goes all in the other direction. So I have been on one or two sets that are mostly women and they're fantastic. Everyone's so nice. It's, it's live, great. Isn't it? It's this really positive working together. But then also this funny thing that happens is like it's very hard to look for all women sets because there's always some dudes that are like, oh, that's discrimination. And you're like, oh yeah, but every other set is all dudes. <laughs> so it's a tricky, you have to like do it in kind of a delicate way because it is a violation to hire someone based on gender or race. You know, but come on. So I don't know, that's been like kind of a, a delicate Th thing that's, sometimes. That's actually something that um, Adam and I were joking about earlier, um, about Locals Are Heroes. There was, I, I think, I can't remember her name, but uh, you know, she just simply made the, the statement, um, I'm looking to increase my database of more women, more people of color, uh, people with different sexualities, whatever, um, you know, and their hiring pool. And man, the kind of vitriol that that it's person insane. got. It was insane. It was, like a, it was like 800 comments by the end of it before it got deleted. For those of you who don't know, um, Local Zero Heroes is a local Facebook group where like, PAs and other entry-level production oh, yes. people can meet. Um, there's about like 14,000 strong now. Um, <coughs> and um, um, Local Zero Heroes. Um, but yeah, it, it, it became such uh, kind of this aggression towards the idea of increasing that opportunity because I think there is somehow the mindset that by giving those options to people who are not the standard straight white male, that somehow they're giving away their opportunity, which is uh, a very hard perspective to change because it implies that, or it implies that in order to change it, you have to give an idea of empathy towards whoever has an issue with it. Um, I forget why I went down this. I, th I think there are but, also a lot of people in that group that are simply sour 
that they're yeah. not getting they're, they're and they're either, not working. They're either they're not working, they're not moving up, and and so there's a lot of just pent up aggression that comes out in different ways. So I would say like if you're if you're thinking about joining that group, just know going into it. You're, they're, they're interesting comments. Mm -hmm. There's always people on Facebook. That are, there's always white guys on Facebook that are like, ah, amount. and just yeah. do you want to take the emotional energy to like one on one try to explain your view of the world? Maybe. Okay, so I'm going to say something that's systemic. So, Lorette, I don't, this isn't a personal pointing finger so much as like the whole point of the conversation is to talk about why this is happening. And I feel like one of the things that happens a lot is like, I just keep hearing like the white male, the white male, the white male, this big cloud of white male. And it's like, um, if you think about like, like the, the realms of discrimination, so like race, class, gender, or whatever, you think it's like, you know, white people and then people of color, and then like poor people and rich people, and then you think like men and women, and I think that what's it called, as a non-binary person, a non-conforming person, an androgynous person, I don't care what name, I'm just flesh. <laughs> um, I think it gets like, I think that's kind of traumatic. Like I think that's the thing that fucks you up is that you, you always are thinking that like, like the feminine spectrum is like the one that's like under attack when it's like rea in reality of like, you know, go back to like the earliest films and I mean like romances were with like white men and women, like, you know, so many of the things that we have, like I don't really see like white women struggling and I think, I'm not saying this uh, as a moment of bitterness but as a moment of transformation where it's like the reason for that is because like in like the scheme of gender, like we're not talking about trans and gender non-conforming people, like they just have not been mentioned like sexualities have been mentioned. I think um, I'm trying to say non-straight, non-white, non-male. I don't know if that's what you're, you mean. But I'm trans, trans people and gender non-conforming people are like, that's not a sexuality, it's a, it's a gender. Okay. Um, and so, sorry, I don't know if you heard, I was saying earlier that, well, I'll let you finish, I was saying earlier that I, I, there was a bunch of different um, genders on the last film that I was doing, which is, just, very, which is very rare, I'm I agree just, with you. Yes, I hear you, I'm just kind of like, um, Kind of taking this moment to like educate, I guess. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm just like stating that like the reason why like <laughs> this white male cloud happens is because we don't talk about transgender non conforming people of color. Um, and to think about them, to think about us, um, is to think about like different narratives. Like it'd be so cool that there'd be like uh, like films and TV shows where like transgender non conforming people of color were in it that weren't playing transgender not conforming people of color, but we're, we're just people. Right. We're just people living lives, right. you know what I'm saying? Um, that's kind of what I'm saying, it, and not just for you three, but like for everybody, like if you're making films or whatever, it's like inviting these people in is so important because <coughs> one, they exist, and two, like, you know, what kind of stories can happen if like we move beyond those things? Um, I have one little comment. Uh, on one feature I did, it was mostly, most of the cast were white male. And, what do you call the test? The Bechdel test, mm -hmm. right? Which is like, if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's like a hysterically low bar that most films fail, which I think you have to have two women. Two main characters. Two women that are named talk to each other about anything other than a man for more than 30 seconds and like every 90% mm, of movies fail or something. So, and this is just one little anecdotal story. I, I was shooting a feature and almost everyone in it was a white guy and I just mentioned it to the director and he kind of laughed awkwardly and then I was like, well, maybe we could change one. And he like thought about it and he did. Mm -hmm. And then he changed it back because the boob jokes didn't work. <laughs> it was like the first time that I was like, oh, maybe I can like actually be like, hey, maybe the doctor doesn't have to be yeah. a guy. I get, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I bring that up because like my main objective for being here is to like network, I guess, because I'm just like a growing artist here, and I would like to like network with people that like would see me as like a full thing as opposed to just like, just like niche thing am i making sense like yes yeah it's like it's like you know i'm not a guy i'm not a girl and like i am of like all this like weird like racial
and I should be in these stories, and that should not be like my main thing, you know? That's real. Like, that'd be so cool, and like that'd be great art, like, sure. like, because boxes don't work anyway. Like, like histories are way more complex than that. It's not just about like my personal story. It's like the stories of ancestors, the stories of like like lines of of like migration and blah blah blah. Okay, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> One thing I challenge myself to do um, is when I write. Uh, my screenplays is before I start writing my first draft, I change the gender of the main characters because, like, by default, just because I've consumed so many like films and there's so many like testosterone just naturally in the way movies are, is <clears throat> like I challenge myself. Okay, I'm gonna change my main character to a woman. I'm gonna change this character to a gay man or like. A transgender person. I haven't tried transgender yet, but you challenged me to do that. I'm going to do that next time. But like, and the 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 way that your story opens up when you do that um, is is it's 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 a mammoth improvement to your story. And if you if it goes back to what I what I was saying earlier about being deliberate. If you deliberately challenge yourself to do that. And if we teach other people to be deliberate in challenging themselves to do those things, the, the stories that we tell are gonna get so much better, you know? And I, I think that's why I bring it up. And I guess I'm just making this like really personal about why, why the hell am I here then? Um, it's like, I, I'm just like interested in making like good art uh, without this kind of eye roll moment. I really just want to make good work so that like, you know, People like me like find it and like are touched by it and ha and like feel like there's more possibility, and I feel like that's kind of the main reason why I bring it up is like I am excited that like you think about that and that I'm in this room and that we think about that together because like I have that experience you don't have to imagine it like I have that experience you know is the is the rooms about networking and about like making good art I hope I hope I really hope. Um, uh, I don't want to, like, I don't want just just to be the cir circle jerk, so to speak, about, but in a, in, a, in a very pragmatic sense of bringing on people, there is a problem, and I, I look with my, my white male colleagues, my white female colleagues, there's always this issue that comes, and then I actually, I think I said this to you one time, when we, I was like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to hire in a more inclusive, diverse way, but the skill set is it's not even high enough. It, I came in like this, there was one, one instance where I had to replace myself for um, a branded shoot. And um, so they were, the DP they were gonna bring on was like, okay, we need to drop out the ACs or whatever. The producer was like, hey, can we get like, some, can we get a couple of ACs, can you get the camera team to be like women and women of color? And I'm like, sure. I thought about it for 10 minutes, I'm like, I literally, can't find anyone because they don't have the skill set. Not. I, can I speak to that? Yeah. Okay. So I think that my, I guess a good goal would be to have it be everyone's responsibility to to make it so that they know those people. So I mean, for instance, there's at least two different groups of female cinematographers online that act as resources. ICFC. dot com is International Collective of Female Cinematographers. Cinematographers XX. dot com is another one. But because of this exact issue, because when people are like, oh, I just don't know anyone to hire, um, there's also a, I think it's completely open, a Google Doc where people are putting in names of crew and recommendations for them so that, you know, because like right now it's a little bit like, oh, I have to invent the wheel if I want a female sound mixer. You know, if I don't happen to know a female sound mixer and I want to make sure I'm at least considering one, then I have to take, you know, my time. And I think this is what we should all be doing to like reach out, send a text to three people and be like, hey, I'm looking for a good female sound mixer. Um, so one, I think we should all take the responsibility to do that. But two, there, there are these, there's a, at least two Google Docs where like all of, I was going to say us, meaning female DPs, but a number of people I know have like filled them out at great length with like, oh, these are first ACs, that let, and this is their contact info, this is their experience level, their union or non, I, Loretta Prevo, recommend them, and they're based in New York. And so like, so that's one resource, you know, that you could be put in touch with, but I think that, I mean, that's going back to like, oh, I just hired the best person I know, like it's on us to take that effort. Can you make that resource uh, available? 
to us, or Adam, you can send out a link for that or, or something. Yeah, let me see if I can take it on the video as well. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to um, pivot. Oh, go sorry, on. and I, I just want to respond to that again. Um, number two is you're saying that uh, you felt that the skill levels wouldn't be at the level which you feel appropriate to be recommended by you. And my, and it's because of opportunity. Sorry. It's because of opportunity and, and oh, access. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. No, that got, we, we, you yeah. and I both know like that. that the but issue I think that's... it's who you know. I don't think it's opportunity. I mean, I think there's a ton of people that fit these little boxes that work at a very high level. No, no, no. I, I agree. But I, there's just one thing that I want to uh, add a caveat to you. Um, I've been on some of the <laughs> highest, uh, like highest uh, procedural shows, highest impact shows as far as location. Um, not everyone's good. I... But, uh, trust me. So, if, <laughs> so, and, and again, trust me. And this is from as you, as I told you, that I had to be above and beyond to even get to where I was. Uh, I'll put it to you this way. Um, so, first, it's one of the hottest shows. Uh, I go and I apply with my resume. Six years of work, uh, or sorry, at that point is five years of work, whatever. But like as a location manager, so about thirty or so films at that point, as the head of department with people underneath me, gunshots, everything that they would need, right? I'm hanging out with my friend who's a scout for it. Uh, we're out, we're just gonna see Interstellar, hang out in the theater with a couple of the people, and I happened to meet one of the assistants on this show, which I applied for. Uh, he had worked two jobs in reality in LA, never did location before in his yeah. entire life, and was now on the hottest show uh, on Was he good? No. no. He, wasn't, he wasn't qualified at all. But if they're able to get in their people, whether it's a friend group or, or whatever, they know each other back from college, what have you, we should be able to also be able to make those steps. And I understand that we want to make sure that we're, we're recommending someone there, the top, 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 top clear, but we shouldn't, again, shut down. I, I understand what you're saying, but... Because how else do they get the opportunity? No, I, I, agree, I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, it's about who you know, it's about who you know, and so lending the opportunity and being the catalyst to, lend, to create that opportunity. But this extra scrutiny. I, I agree. This extra, you know, this extra scrutiny when it's, you know, I don't have to, I, uh, you, this extra scrutiny where like you bring on your, the homies bring on his boys and they suck and it's like this extra, it's a double slap in the face. So when Quincy and I, like, like, I always bring a Quincy and I, but like, we'll, we'll be running for the same jobs and they're like, oh, we should give this to our other like, quote unquote, woman of color or color friend. But then it, like, it tops out. It's it, it, like, it tops out. But, at, but like, it tops us. out for you. It doesn't top out, right? I, I, okay. I'm you don't, not, right? Okay. But no, I'm really curious. You really think it like, that no, there's I don't not think, like I'm a not, good I'm, black woman shooter? No, no, I, I, I know they are. Yeah. I, work, I work with them, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I, we had a we had a we had a PA at my last job. He was terrible. He was terrible. Um, he was he was black, and it was an extra. It was like a it was an extra sting, because they they kept bringing up he was he's they, like a site director, uh, like a guy with no technical experience. Like th that PA was really bad. If he was you kn you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was already a strike against him. Yeah, it was an extra strike against him. So that's yeah. why I'm extra. I'm really careful about who I bring on. They don't now, have. The can can I can I can I can I put something? Yeah, that so I don't understand. No, 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 no. I, I understand exactly what you're saying, but what 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 I'm hearing is there's a lack of something, um, or what, what's not being stated. The fact is, um, if you're bringing someone on that you yourself know they may not have the skill sets currently available for the job, but they can learn over the course of it. If they have the ability to adapt and the ability to, to take on the knowledge and to learn from their mistakes and go forward. I would say it is up to you as the person who's hiring and bringing them on to shepherd them underneath your wing. Not everyone I hire is gonna be absolutely good at what they're doing the first time. Absolutely, they're not going to be. I expect them not to be. But I defend them to the end of, of the day in terms of if they're hardworking, if they're putting the work forward, they're persevering, and they're gaining knowledge, then we'll push through to the end. Maybe it also depends a little on the job. So I don't know your particular position and in, in role at Mysterious Company A, but I guess I work on a lot of low-budget stuff where it is easier to shepherd someone. And it is easier to be a little bit riskier, you know, or like maybe the person doesn't have 10 years of experience, they have like three and this is the new position, but like, I, I don't know. But, it, but 
that's it, I guess your comment like it it, it hurt, not hurts me, but it's, un, it's such an unfortunate that that is the reality or as the way you're thinking about it, you know. The scrutiny. Mm -hmm. it's, it's because it's, that's what it is. So, buddy. Hey. Um. Can you hear me? Hey. I'm Mark. Hey, nice Mark. To meet everyone. Um. I'm an actor trying to be a filmmaker, so <laughs> it's kind of cool to see like from behind the scenes when I'm always in front. Um. I'm trying to, I guess I'm picking back off what I got here so far in terms of, um, let me see if I got this right. Um, I felt kind of, I did kind of get hurt by his comment because um, Damn, I'm not, a lot, and a, a lot of people think that, and going back what he said too, not from, I guess in my perspective, I've always lived in black neighbors. I'm a, near, I'm a native here, I've been all around. So I can't say that black people don't have the interest to do these things. Everyone has the interest to do things, but you don't know until you spark it. And I've had a lot of friends who are, I want to be a videographer, I want to do DP, but I don't have the access or the resources to do that. So what we're trying to do is scramble to get that piece of pie, you know what I'm saying? I've had opportunities where I've had friends who are PAs, DPs, my black <coughs> friends, and I get it with the whole, we're already gonna have that mark against us. And I'm seeing that, I already know that, like I want to be a part of this, I'm gonna be on my best behavior to not make you look bad, but also not make myself bad. But my thingy is, um, how am I gonna say it? Uh, we all have that opportunity to wanna do things, but you can't, we don't know how. And then when we want, when we come to somebody and you kinda put like slap our hand away, it kinda makes it where now I don't wanna do this anymore because I'm trying to get in the business. And I can't, it, it, it's hard to say like black people have to put black people on so that we can get to the white people so we can you know branch out that's how it is from I feel in my perspective and um, like I said I don't have all the access and resources to you know I, I'm from Queens I have to go all the way to brick just to do something film wise so that's kind of sucky but you gotta do and if you're hungry for it you're gonna do it but a lot of people there we're not I'm not gonna say we're I'm not gonna speak for all black people but some of us want to do it, we're scared to do it, but we're trying to look for that spark. Because I know half the time, people I didn't even know who wanted to do these things, where I was like, hey, I'm doing this song, I write on Facebook, hey, I'm doing this, this, and this, and this, I need people. In my inbox, I, people I wouldn't even expect, like, oh, you want to do this? Okay, come ahead, you know? Like, you know? And I feel like a lot of us are trying to learn from just doing. A lot of us are tactile learners, we want to learn from doing, um, not some of us in the take classes, we're self-taught now, and we're trying to learn from other people, but if you're gonna like push me away because I probably, like I said, I don't have the skill set we do, but I'm willing to learn. And I, going off what you said, you have to, again, trust the person that they're going to, you know, don't write me off because I may not have the experience, but I can surprise you when I'm on set, what I apply, what I learn from everyday life, and just learning from watching and doing. And I think that's all I have to say. Can, can I I'm, say something briefly? Yeah. Because what I, um, I don't have the same experience that you have, but what I have heard when, because I've gone to different like women in film type panels, and sometimes on more corporate levels, one thing that is talked about is the whole like idea of room at the table, right? And that like, but theoretically, theoretically, this was a while ago. But like when you're the first woman in the room, you feel like the other women coming up are a reflection on you, and. But a lot of the conversations, I'll, I'll give it to you after this to see, a lot of the conversations they have around that is trying to change that mentality from being, oh, there's not enough room at the table to like, how do, how do you help? But I feel like you want to say something. I, I, think, I think people, I don't want to sound like the, okay. I don't want to, be, I don't want to ironically sound like a Fox News correspondent. Okay. Um, yeah. So like, please don't. I think, I think people, I, and I don't, I, and please don't, I'm not trying to use bait words. I think people's sensitivity is misconstruing like what I'm trying to say, and it's not being conveyed properly. It's not that I'm slapping someone's hand away because they don't have experience. I, bring, I, I do my damnedest to always include not just black people or black women, but brown people, Asian, uh, Asian South Asian women, uh, non-binary trans to production for the voices to be heard. There's situations where metaphorically I have a 357 to my head and I can't 
bring someone that's gonna make my brand look bad and the next person that comes after me or, or that person bad. So I have to just throw the bone and just hire Trevor Williams from Cincinnati, Ohio, who's 32 years old, blonde hair and blue eyed, just to make sure that I, I gave that recommendation a, a solid chance. Well, and then I think I think sorry, that's the the the, the difference in between w the situation that you're having, the situation um, in which I'm trying to represent to you. Um, I don't hire anybody who will make my brand look bad. However, what I'm stating is what and what I try to articulate. Maybe I didn't say it well enough. Is that if there is someone who is um, capable in their work ethic, in their drive and in their want and ability to gain the knowledge to do the job. And they have an intermediate level, they're not quite at, you know, they're like a 2.5 and I need them at a three. Can I take them on this job from 2.5 to three? Then yes, I'm gonna do that. But if you're gonna come up there and you're gonna act a fool and you just you say you wanna do it but you don't really wanna do it, that's different. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying hi that, I'm saying the person's like, all right, listen, like I know you only got like two commercials under your belt. This is gonna be like a week and a half long. So you think you can do it? All right, cool. Let's, I think the big disconnect that you guys are having is that um, perhaps you're mentioning like, the unfair burden of having to be like that person yeah, of colors. I, don't understand. <laughs> I think that's, if people really misunderstand what I'm saying, it's kind of frustrating. Like, my job is not abstract. It's, it's, qual it's, a, it's math and science and law. Huh? I, I'm, a, I'm a video lead at a major media company. I can't bring. I can't do like help me hand. I I, get, I literally give people jobs. There's certain situations that I can't bring someone with the. I don't have that latitude sometimes to bring to bring that person on because well, I don't have the, the time to even train that person because I'm not there. I, that's, I, what, that's 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 what I'm saying. And, and let's let them. Hey, um, <laughs> um, Alberto and the um, buddy in the back. Yeah. Oh. So. Um, well, let's, let's like, I'll try to answer oh, first. Oh, sorry, uh, my bad. Yeah. Yes. We got Hello. this. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> um, I feel like something that's like, it's like a missing step, which isn't bad, is, or, or not a missing step, just, yeah, I guess a missing step in the logic is like, this is about um, movement, it's about direction, so it's like, if someone like wants something, like if someone's like, you know, <laughs> help me be a star, but they haven't like had enough experience, like obviously you can't just immediately send them to the person that's gonna make them a star, but if you do have experience in this field, then you probably like know other people that can support in this route. So it's like, you need to go talk to this person who's gonna hook you up with a class, or like set you up with some program, or this is a program that I know, and you can skill build, and then like a year or two, then you can come back to me, where instead of like this, this sort of like just closed door because you're not ready, like, you know, it, it, you're still supporting the movement of this person, it's just not as immediate. Like, I mean, I, I want things, but I, I'm not just gonna be like, hey, like you can give me that, because I, I don't, I wouldn't even feel confident doing it yet, but like, I'm hoping that someone in this room knows like the next step or the next person to talk to. Um, and also like just cultivating like a relationship of care where it's like, you're not gonna get it now, but I want to know where you're at because I wanna know where you're, how you're growing. And then if like in a year or two, like I've seen where you've grown, it's like now I know where I can move you to. Like I just couldn't in the moment because Honestly, like you didn't really know where you were going, but now that you do know where you're going, it's not shady, it's just honest. Like, our lives change, like, we just change direction. We want to be singers, we end up being musicians. Like, like now that I see what you're doing, I, I can I still find a way that I can move you if you want that support from me. And I think that's what I, I didn't articulate well. Yeah, that, in that moment, yeah, in that moment. In that transitional moment, that the, I'm gonna pass it to you, right? Sorry about that. Um, in that transitional moment, I am there to be quote unquote omnipresent in their growth, but like I can't my money and my and like other people with skill sets like yourself or Quincy, that like if I hire Joe Blow from around the block to do this job, that's gonna make you and I look bad for other. Do you understand what I'm saying? Thank sure. you. Sure. Cool. What's your name, buddy? Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's, a, that's a long wire. We gotta go. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Ronnie. Hey, Ryan. Um, basically, I I think uh, I guess I don't think. By the way, I don't think anybody was like coming at you. I think I, 
don't feel like that way. I just think people are like, yeah, you know. Um, it's all love. It's all I just feel like, talking, we just talking. I feel like, like what Phil was saying, if someone's a 2.5 and the job is a three, I think sometimes you kinda, kinda gotta just take a risk on somebody. And if I look at like my career, most of the times that I've grown the most, I've taken a job that I wasn't ready for. Mm -hmm. And I took it and I grew so much from it. And like, if you wanna put people on, you know, the people that you're trying to put on don't have the same opportunities as the people that are threes. That's why they're threes and we're not. And you gotta just take that risk. And like, I started working at a really young age, like probably younger than I should have because I probably like made some mistakes. But like, I met Adam when I was 17. I was first day seeing for him. And I th we were shooting on like a red epic. I've never seen this camera before, why my fault? And I remember he was, there was like a point on set where he was like, now's not time for learning, we're shooting. Because I didn't know what we were doing. And then after that, I was like, all right, before I take any job, I gotta make sure that I know my, my stuff. <laughs> but I just think you gotta take a risk, man. Like, I've, I've definitely been in positions where, and you know, like you're in a, really in a position of power. Like, you really can make an impact more so than most people. And you have a perspective that most people don't have. So I think even if it is at your own expense, I think that if you, tell people that and communicate that, that like, yo, I'm taking a chance on you. I think people will really like respect that and appreciate that and do their best to not, because like disappointing someone else is sometimes way harder than disappointing yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think um, people will really listen and like, I think that's how people will like push themselves to try to be to that point. Yeah, pressure, pressure, you know, it molds people. Can I, um, can I kind of shift, if we're good on this part, can kind of shift our topic? Yeah. Something I thought of um, a while ago, is I'm in a position where sometimes I talk to uh, female DPs that are at a very high level, and I have found, and maybe they're in a privileged position to say this, but definitely the way they think of themselves and the way they recommend thinking of yourself is not as a female DP and not positioning yourself as a victim. And I don't, I mean, I definitely don't want to get hired because I am a lady DP. That means like you're probably telling a really lady story, or you shouldn't be telling it, and you're just trying to excuse that by like you know hiring a lady DP. But so like I, I definitely want to be hired because I am awesome and I'm personable and I'm skilled, and that's how I think of about, think of it for me, and that's how I would encourage everyone to think of it for them. But then I also think of it as I'm lucky to be in this position that I can sometimes recommend and hire people, and in that way, I want to have influence. I just wanted to say that. Um, I want to, um, uh, one question I have is, like, as a lot, a lot of the big questions, things we discussed have been discrimination, um, feelings of isolation, um, feelings of, like, the brick wall that's stopping you from getting ahead in your career, um, that can take a big, like, emotional toll on people. I know just personally, I've just had days where I've just been pissed about things like that. Um, you talked about feeling, you enraged or something. How do you guys like deal with being an other on your sets or in your offices? How do you just make it psychologically through that challenge? Well, how I do it, I just become the biggest statement in the room. If you're all gonna turn your heads, I'm gonna make it, you're gonna know who I am for the first time I walk in the door. That's how I cope with it. If I'm the loudest thing in the room, then I'm gonna quiet out all the noise. I'm gonna silence all that, so I feel Coping with it is more of being within yourself by presenting yourself outwards in a way that's not offensive. I don't want to, you know, I can't scare white people with too much of my blackness, but let me tone it, you know, in that sense, tone it, I don't want to say tone it down, but be respectful. And sometimes you'll get the respect back. Sometimes people will know, don't mess with you, but don't mess with you in a sense. So I feel like if you put your personality right then and there, and I say, this is the type of person I am, this is what you're dealing with it, and I'm in a professional and respectful manner, we're good. And I think that always will work. You have to have like a presence and a command and let you know, don't cross that boundary. And I think that's how I deal with like Copeman being the only, I mean, the only dreadhead in the room, and everyone's gonna always, hey, point to me when everything goes wrong or whatever. It's just, no, he's, he did what he needed to do. He already made, I, I, he, Mark is good. We, we already spoke about this prior. So I feel like being and letting people know you're here and making that stamp in that ground and being authentic, genuine, and respectful 
is the best way to cope with it. It just rubs off. It just all falls off. What's up, buddy? Thank you. Um, the way I handle it is like, I, this is a lesson my dad taught me. It's like, you show up or get shown up, you know? And when I get in situations where I'm the only, when I'm the other, I, I, I allow myself a couple of seconds to acknowledge it because if I don't acknowledge it every time with, within myself, then I'll lose sight of it and I don't want to ever lose sight of it. But I acknowledge it, I take like 20 seconds to be like, damn, I'm the only one here. And then I show up, you know, I just like, all right, this is what it is. I can either, I can decide to let it affect my work or I can decide to let it not affect my work. And I always choose the latter. And that's, I mean, I'm not where I want to be yet, but that's how I got where I am, you know? And you have no choice but to, to proceed, you know? You just have to bring it. What's up, Berto? Is Berto um, okay with you? Huh? Is Berto okay with you? <laughs> um, I, um, I'm thinking about something that would be exciting would be um, not putting all of the onus on, on like marginalized folks, like I guess being like the best. Because I mean, like I'm not trying to be extra, but we usually are just because we already bring different, like what we do is different. Like it's not, I'm not, it's like how we are is different, and that is interesting. That is, I mean, people have not seen these things because people have not been seeing us. So it, I don't think that's hard. Um, but I do think that, like, regardless of how like awesome, how much you stand out, like, you can still feel isolated. Um, and I think something that I just thought about uh, while everyone was talking that was exciting would be just like. Uh, to grow like a check-in culture where it's like everybody that has a position of power in this room kind of just have more space to like talk. So I went to, um, I went to Stanford um, and I, I mean, I, before that I was in like a small town in Tennessee uh, and I was actually like, um, I guess experienced more violence based on like race <coughs> than like gender, uh, which was surprising. Um, and, and then, and I was like, I was like excelling because I like needed to get out. Then I get to Stanford where's where I wanted to be. And the, the standards were way higher than I ever imagined. And it was like incredibly traumatizing. Um, this is going to become a long story, but there's a point. Um, I just don't understand how the entire time that I was there in four years, not one professor was ever like, are you okay? Like, you know, you're clearly seeing that I'm not like submitting my papers on time or anything like that. And like, you know, when I speak like the few times, it's pretty good, but I'm usually quiet. Like, why is that? And I think that's because people just don't understand that it, like, or not understand, it's like, there should just be a culture where it's like, are you good? And it's like, I have the power or I have like, ways of making things better. Like, maybe I can't like, you know, get you to a higher position, but at least I can like listen to you while you tell me like what, what sucks, you know, and that way you're not even, you're not alone. Like, we still have to figure out how we're gonna like find a solution for what's hurting you, but you're not alone. Just like logics like that where we think about talking to people more and just like creating a culture where we talk about what's wrong and not just talk for the sake of talk, but for the sake of like people need to be heard, especially like marginalized folks. Like, if there is that one black person, that one trans, gender nonconforming person in the room, they probably are feeling some type of way. Like, it's not, it's not a big leap of the imagination to think that. Um, it's, it's isolating to not see a body like yours. So check in. I've been trying to keep an objective voice the whole time, but I, I do want to drive home that point that checking in people is so important. I work at a um, big three-letter corporate media company now. Um, and like one thing, one thing I tried to do when I started is just say hello to all the black people, like yeah. the young black pages and interns and PAs and stuff like that. Yeah. And now, um, like seven months in, there's my boss jokes that there's a, like always a crowd of black people around my desk because you know, just people 
like having someone to say hi to them and be like, are you okay, right. young Paige? Um, so it, 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 can, it can change yeah. someone's entire... And, and to be honest, I feel like, I mean, I feel like that's already happening. Like, I feel like there's some people in, the, in this room that are already noticing me more than others. And it's not even, I think, identity. I, I think, of course, that's a factor in it. But I think just because of the fact that maybe I've already talked about <laughs> how I'm quivering, you know, like, I feel like it's like, oh, that person probably has something to say, but they need support in saying it kind of thing. Okay. Just understand that. We're going to bring a mic to you. Yeah, well, I, I just want to <laughs> say something real quick. How, how, how I usually deal with being the other in my situation is... <laughs> I usually, you know, laugh it off or joke if it's a joker or whatever, and then I will address it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, like pull a person aside in a private situation. That way it won't be so awkward for either of us. So usually on a one-on-one -on -one thing, you can get your point across and the other person will understand. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi. OK, so this is a general question for um, everybody up there. It's not like, how did you get into the, uh, the position you are now? Because I missed the beginning part. Um, but it's basically, how do you deal with um, inside your work competition? So basically, that feeling of you're always looking over your shoulder to see what that next person is doing or in comparing it to your own success. Um, how do you deal with that anxiety of like, oh, oh my gosh, I, I'm not where I need to be right now. Like I need to hop to this place because I need to do that. And you know, all these other people are, you know, just maybe your coworkers that are, in, are, that are in that same position as you, you know, maybe got a promotion or moved around and you're like, oh, I have these skill sets. Um, how do I get to that point? Have you guys ever felt that, you know, when you first started or? So are you talking about competition from other people in your position or it, competition amongst the entire I mean, I think, yeah, in, in, in the entire project, doesn't matter if they're next to you or not, but maybe, leaning towards more that they're in the same position. Let's say you're you're in that same entry level or you're in that same AP or you're in that same producer kind of like that. Like have you um, ever have you ever felt that with the people that you were working with and uh, how did you um, conquer that? Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a bit of an oddity in that um, in the in the fact like what what I do in terms of the location department um, uh, generally, the people who they care about more hearing from on, on a full project basis is going to be the director, the DP, and the production designer. Um, I'm sitting back, kind of making sure everything goes. Uh, so what I like, I, I know my role in the fact that they don't often want to hear my opinion, but I do know as the foundation of, of everything that's going to be seen on screen, I kind of interject where I do with confidence in, in, in just my knowledge of, of what I'm doing. Um, in regards to competition from, is this against other people of color or against other people, period, in my position? I don't, sorry, I just wanted to clarify No, no, that. no, I, I don't think it's, I'm kind of coming at it in a non-caller um, perspective. Uh, but just competition, period. Yes, yeah. And if color, I mean, yeah, if you, if you feel like it is more, of you think you're, you, you are more because of the color, but I, in the way that I'm asking the question, I think it's more general. Okay. Um, Pass the mic to the guy to the right. He might have an answer to you, too. Um, in, t in terms of competition in general in my position, uh, at this I, I don't, go, I, 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 I enjoy competition. Like, that's why I, I like, uh, I, you, were, you came a little bit later, but I was telling the, everybody that, like, as I bring up people underneath me, I expect them to be um, in a higher position in the next year. So if my ALM is not pushing me, my assistant, my direct assistant, isn't pushing me or gaining a knowledge up to a level at my point, I feel like I'm not properly being pushed. You know what I mean? Like, um, so competition from anybody else doesn't really uh, phase me too much. There is one aspect of it though that, um, that does interest me, just in terms of different rates that people are getting. Uh, because there's sometimes that I'll hear rates that other people are getting, which I always wanna focus on my job and how effective I am and what my pay should be and what uh, you know everything else and benefits should be, uh, but I do take note of it. Not necessarily to to change the way in which I'm responding or or acting or adapting to the current like landscape, uh, but I do take note of it and then act accordingly in requesting it in my next job or or what have you. So I, I try not to let it affect me too much, but like I still push forward on my own my own strive. Uh, 
Yeah, I think um, there's a bit of a <clears throat> generational disconnect going on right here because we're coming from a generation where um, people are expected to be a lot more successful at a lot younger of an age and everyone's also posting their like small little victories on social media constantly. So it's like, oh, you know, we all know film is a fickle industry, right? Like sometimes you have a really hot six weeks and then it's like, oh shit, I haven't worked for three weeks. And that's how it is sometimes, more so in the beginning of your career than as it, you progress. And I think something that you have to remember is like, everyone has a different path and other people's victory, victories are not my failures. Like, yeah. just because someone is succeeding doesn't mean I'm failing. And I think, like, we have to, like, kind of have this, like, idea of, like, yeah, like, like I think there's enough for everybody to eat. I don't think that j the film industry is just, like, there's a specific group of people that are going to win, and that's how it's going to be. Because not everybody, not one DP can shoot every film. Not one person has the same perspective for every story. And I think just, like, understanding that your time will come and, like, you know, just kind of look away from your phone a little bit sometimes because it is overwhelming. I'm not going to lie. Like, sometimes I'm, like, scrolling through. Like, what am I doing? But I mean, it's all good, you just, know? Just I'm a little sorry. hint of advice that someone gave me a uh, real yeah, long time ago. So if, you keep looking, <laughs> if you keep looking left and right, you're not looking at where you're going forward. Yeah. So I always try to kind of keep that mindset. You can glance at where you are in the standings, but focus on your own, on your own path. Sure. It's, um, it's getting a little, little late, and like, I've been sitting longer than I've sat in, like, years um so i i want us to leave on an optimistic note um sh should we talk about a bit about like solutions and ways that we can make the world less effed up when we leave um yeah what do you think what, what should we do going forward like how, how how can we ideas both big and big and small make the world a less homogenous more diverse um place? i i think big and small small uh or let me do big first uh big uh Everyone who decided to come to this event tonight, I'm pretty positive that we all share the same mindset in time of, of growing diversity um, in whichever field that we're working in. Um, so big, which will have the biggest impact in terms of, uh, of everybody else coming up, is to gain more uh, power positions, keep pushing ourselves, uh, again, focusing on our own path to get up to a different level that we can then shepherd people that are coming up beneath us. And then small, I would just say, um, like uh, like we were talking about earlier, that passive assumptiveness, like I don't think I should be able to do this or get in this position of kind of just looking at the people next to us and saying like, hey, like you can go ahead and you can do this or do that thing or if they don't have the knowledge, here's where you're gonna get the knowledge, here's where you can gain these skill sets in order to move forward. So it's looking at the people around you and then also striving up on our own vertically. Um, I, mean, I guess there's kind of two things to think about and one is like what we can each do and then the other is how to get the larger group to also do stuff and I think that's the trickier one um, but one I don't know I'm excuse me <coughs> I recently um, had a woman work for me as a gaffer on two projects and I thought she was really good and then she sent me an email saying oh you know I've been struggling finding work the last few weeks I'm kind of new to New York and I wrote five people, like DPs or producers, about her. And like I had her like write up her little, you know, a couple sentence resume in her contact. And I sent it out to some people saying, "Hey, I've worked with this woman on two projects." And um, and she was like extraordinarily thankful for that. And I think it paid off. And so that was like one really direct way that I don't normally think to help people in that way. But then like the next job I did, someone was really good, and I was like, "Oh, hey, if you write a couple sentences up about yourself in your contact, I'll send this out again." So. I mean, I do really think that that kind of stuff does come back to you tenfold, um, and that's a really direct way that you can specifically do something. So, like, we could be like, hey, guys, everyone in this room, send out five of those little emails about someone in the next week. That that would be a goal. Room. So, uh, Loretta, yeah, um, and I forwarded her contact on as well and brought her on two jobs already. So, yeah. Adam pips me so out every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, this gentleman and then Quincy. All right, so this is going to sound a little crazy, but uh, bear with me. Uh, I was just on a job. Four, uh, there was four of us. We traveled to a couple different cities doing stuff. Four white guys, right? But <laughs> here's, here's, what, I, here's what, I, what I noticed about that as I'm, I'm hearing you guys speak about this. What really, um, what really put us, brought us together was not the color of our skin, but the excellence. Or not our gender, but the excellence that each one had. 
Um, our, our sound guy uh, is an amazing musician, and he's got such a great ear for sound. Um, so he was able to, to uh, deal with acoustics in a room in a way that was above and beyond any other sound guy that I had worked with. That had nothing to do with, with his gender, with his race, with his age, with, uh, he was Australian, I don't know if that counts. But, um, and, and I think if, if everybody does that and builds their own team, he, you were talking about before about bringing people in and, and nurturing them along. But if you form a, a, your, your own tribe of, of just excellence, it doesn't, the rest of it doesn't matter. And that's one way as a pod of, of, of people to, to enter into an environment. Our, our client was Hispanic, so I don't know what can that I, Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. So maybe like my challenge to you would be like, so if the question is how can you help diversity in the film world, is that maybe making a connection with like a really skilled person that isn't a white man to bring on next time? No, I, I think absolutely. But, but I think the, the bigger point is, is if you focus on, on excellence yourself and yeah. on creating your own pod, regardless of what that's made of, that pod will get hired. We get hired because we're able to produce a certain type of content every time under extremely difficult conditions. If you can do that, excellence can't be ignored. And, yeah, and what you, I like about would, that is it's about the work, right? It's about, it's about yeah. the work. It, it just happened to be that, that we were, were for, but I can't see that that, that, that can't work in any other um, well, one, one caveat that I just want to say to that is that I, I think um, one, one part of what we're trying to do to success in diversity is also give access to that excellence to a diverse group of people. So if your sound mixer needs a boom up, I got a guy for you. Yeah. And, and, then, and then continue uh, for that. <coughs> yeah. Are you okay with the microphone over there? I'm, I'm, I'm good now. He was like yeah, thank, his neck Hey. <laughs> Thanks for checking in. I got you. <laughs> um, I think it does have to do with excellence. I think that, to speak to your point, um, Loretta, um, the harder thing is to, the harder part is to like, like, it, like I said before, change, like change the perspective of the people who are already in power. And to your point about like excellence, I think to, to start doing that, we have to remind people, and this is something that I, I think a lot of people, nobody in this room, I'm not accusing anybody of forgetting this in this room, but I think what a lot of people are forgetting, and I mentioned before, is that we have to remind people that they can be excellent. Mm. You know what I mean? And I think that's, that's a big problem with what we're talking about. Like, you're talking about people who don't know that they can do this, and don't, they don't think that they're allowed to do it. So it's hard to be excellent when you don't think it's even possible. You don't even think about it, you know? So I think that in order to build teams and build tribes of excellence, you have to, you know, in tandem in, of doing that, because it's important, is let people know and do this through mentorship as much as possible. It's just like, hey, you're allowed to do this. You know, like my man here, I forget your name, I apologize, Tashin. Uh, you say you're an electrician, you, you're trying to, you know, get into film. At some point, you, you told yourself, I, I can do this, you know? And getting to that point for a lot of, like, minorities and LGBTQ people and women is hard because we're constantly being reminded, not overtly, we're constantly being reminded that we're not allowed. And so it's, encouraging, like, telling people they're doing a great job when they're exactly, doing a great job? Like, exactly. Or, like, presenting the, hey, you ever thought about, like, hey, you have a, a good eye. You ever thought about being a photographer? Ever thought about being a cinematographer? Do you even know what that is? Because, you know, I didn't know what any of this was before I started doing it, you know? So. Last word. And with that being said, uh, <laughs> and, and with that being said, I, I have no experience in the film industry, but uh, a mutual friend of me, Lamar, is basically showing me the ropes and, <coughs> you know, welcoming me to any of her shoots or in editing uh, situations. And I'm just sitting in and learning little by little, but eventually I'll be able to go off on my own and start a filming company or something. Um, I guess as like the person in the center of the panel, I have to give you the last word. So I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, I was speaking to a page at that I didn't mean to say by brand name. <laughs> bleep, bleep that out and bleep that. Do I have to say that too? Okay. Organization B. <laughs> this this uh, person's person of color. Uh, and we're just talking. She said, like, you know, you're a producer. I'm the only black producer on 
my floor. <laughs> um, and she's like, you know, you're a black producer. You often wear bright color t-shirts and jeans to work. How, how did you become this ball of person to be where you are? Um, and one thing I noticed is that a lot of young people who are not straight white men feel the need to just change, sanitize as much of themselves as possible to enter and survive in spaces. And I guess my challenge to all of you is to figure out how to make the people around you feel like they don't have to do that. That's all. Um, before you all get up and go, um, Adam, come here. Uh, I want to I thank Adam for like, organizing this. And... I still remember the job where we met. It was like one of the worst jobs ever, but like he was pretty awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, follow Light Bulb Grip and Electric on Facebook. Yes. Um, let's see. Is there anything else to say? I've never done. I've never like wrapped something up before. Uh, well, I mean, also we're creators, so look at all the stuff we can rent from Adam. Right. And he'll uh, give you discounts. <laughs> Do you give uh, discounts? Sure. So I'm happy to work <laughs> <with> <laughs> okay. With yeah. Uh, the, the one last thing I was just going to add was that afterwards, if you guys, um, as, as we wrap up, if we want to stick around, you're welcome to. We've got drink, cold drinks in the back, and um, I know there's a lot more little conversations that need to happen as well, so we've got another hour, so we'll still be around. There's beer in that cooler. Thank hey. You guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.